Good morning. There's a lot of faces I recognize. Thanks for coming back. Um, it's my great pleasure to introduce Russ Akoff, uh, who's returning for the fourth year. We're calling it uh, the fourth annual Russ Akoff Lecture. Um, I'll ask, how many of you have, were here last year for Russ's lecture? A few hands? Okay. Um, if you haven't seen Russ, you're in for a real treat. If you've seen him before, you're in for a real treat as well. Uh, for those who are aware of the context of what I do here, um, what I sh share with you now will be stuff you've seen. Uh, but for those who aren't aware, I, I've been here since 1990. Uh, it was two companies ago, maybe three companies ago and was brought in to uh, provide training at Dr. Taguchi's work. And I know there's people in the room who went through 40 hours of training on Dr. Taguchi's work. And, uh, and at that time, in the early 90s, what I was puzzled by was, was why were most of the applications fixing things that were broken? And began to ponder why are we spending our time on that, in that manner? And then began to look at Dr. Deming's work and got some glimpse there that that's, that's pretty standard. Focus on things that are broken and, and re manage our resources that way. And, and then came across Russ's work and saw it as very complementary to organizations that aren't encumbered by managing resources by focusing on the broken stuff. In fact, when I saw Russ speak in 2002 for the first time, he referred to our healthcare system as a sickness care system. And I said, well, that, that fits. We, we go to the doctor when we're sick. And I was briefing a group of Boeing executives in the spring before we were spun off. And they were responsible for a large part of Boeing's internal uh, fabrication. And I asked them how much time they spend in a given day discussing parts which are good and arrive on time. All right, how much time do we spend on that stuff? And they, said, they just laughed. I said, well, I said, why not? They're like, well, why would we spend time on that? I said, well, that's just the point. <laughs> that's, in an enterprise thinking organization, people would manage resources, not just focusing on the broken stuff. In fact, my remark to them was, um, you know, that's very similar to the adage, if it's not broken, don't fix it. And they said, yeah, that's pretty much the way we run things. And I said, well, given that belief, when would you put gas in your car? I said, after we run out, I said, well, how much sense does that make? So in that vein, an enterprise thinking organization is one in, in which we don't wait for things to break, un unless it's like a light bulb in your kitchen, the consequences aren't that bad. Um, but if it comes for waiting for your car to run out of gas, we wouldn't necessarily wait that long. So in that context, I'm going to share with you a couple charts. Uh, next chart, please. Okay, so as I mentioned, the thinking I'm sharing with you comes from many sources. I just listed three pictures here, Dr. Deming, Dr. Akoff, and Janichi Taguchi, and, and, and talk about there's many more. And, and today you've got the great fortune to get Russ's perspective for three hours. And then if you're interested, there's uh, other opportunities coming up for Russ to visit here. Next chart, please. Not only uh, in my work here, we talk about better thinking about thinking and, and what is the thinking behind fixing things that are broken, but we've got application results that are pretty awesome. And, and so it's the transformation we're looking at is what does it take to take great thinking and then put it into practice? And, and for those of you who are interested, um, I've got a flyer over here on a nine hour workshop which goes into details on, on the, this thinking I'm sharing with you. And, and in those courses, we will show you applications of, of which many of you are is responsible for because your, your parts go into these engines. Next. Insights, next chart, please. Back it up. One, one prior, please. Yeah, this chart here is, I wanted to share with you a conversation I had with a, an executive from Lufthansa. I was flying back from a, another Boeing site about a year ago, and he asked me what I do, and I said I was traveling around the country within Boeing sites, providing this nine-hour workshop called Enterprise Thinking. And he said, what's it like? I said, well, I ask people questions. He said, what kind of question? I said, I ask people questions like, what would it be like to be in an organization where everyone firmly believed the last straw broke the camel's back? Is what would it be, like? what's a day in the life of a, company, a person in that organization? And he sat back and he said, well, I wouldn't want to be that straw. I said, why not? He says, because everyone would blame me for it. I said, well, what else? He said, well, the other straws would blame me and think they had nothing to do with it. I said, what else? He said, well, people wouldn't share information. I said, what else? He said, people would go it alone and reinvent the wheel. I said, what else? He said, yeah, they wouldn't share. You'd have a culture of blame. 
And I just kept, all I kept asking was, what else, what else, what else? And after five minutes, he says, that's exactly how we operate. To which I said I wasn't surprised. That's pretty much, that's the mechanistic thinking that Russ will share with you. Is, is, it's when we lose context of the greater picture. And so here I'm sharing with you some context to better appreciate Russ's remarks. And, if, and again, if you are interested, we've got courses that go further into these ideas. Next. Next, please. Okay. And, and what the courses are really about, and what, Russ, what I find in better than Russ's work is ideas on how we could better work together, think together, and learn together. Because as long as we believe, okay, that the football game's won in the closing seconds, right, and how often do we hear that? We hear the elections won by the vote count in Florida. That was the, the last election. The other states had nothing to do with it. Okay. It's like thinking that the grade is caused by the student alone and the teacher had nothing to do with it. We fall into that trap. And so, but if we were smarter than that, okay, then we'd have an organization that practices enterprise thinking. I think of the degree to which we could work together if we weren't encumbered by that blame. That's, that's my interest, and that's my interest in, in helping work with Kim and Paul to bring a bring Rusty this morning. Next. So I think we need is thinking that promotes better discovery, and Russ will give you a good glimpse of that this morning. Okay, as I mentioned, uh, this is Russ's fourth visit here. We've had Dr. Taguchi three times. Okay. And uh, next year he'll be back for his fifth visit. We were, had a full day session yesterday in Huntington Beach. Next, please. In addition, a number of us within Canoga Park and outside, we, have, we, we teamed together in 2001, formed an organization called the Into and Thinking Network. Our, our vision was to host an annual forum, uh, which started off as a four-day event. It's now a six-day event. And this coming April will be our fifth annual forum. We've got flyers over here on it. We have two days of pre-conference workshops, including things like enterprise thinking. Um, in fact, this year, Russ Akoff is doing a pre-conference workshop on the title of Creativity and What to Do With It. He's also a featured keynote speaker on Saturday morning talking about the mistakes that managers make. Okay, so we've got people like Russ coming up. And then we also have post-conference workshops. And you know, over on the side, we've got three of Russ's most recent books as well as a flyer you can pick up on this Enterprise Thinking class. It's offered free. And the uh, Into and Thinking Network forum, you can get information on that. Okay, next. OK, and with that, I'll just tell you a few things about Russ. Um, He's the author of 22 books. His last three, definitely his last two, are over there. He's working on his 23rd. It'll be out in the fall. I've had the great fortune of spending the last two days with him. Uh, three weeks ago, I was in his office for three days. Uh, we, we featured Russ as part of a monthly conference call. We had 70-some people calling in across the country asking him questions about his work. He retired. He's re been retired from the University of Pennsylvania where he taught for a I'm guessing 50 years, he'll give me, he'll correct me on that. But his experience goes back, goes back a long ways. He was in many places at the right time. And the stories he will share with you today are um, his crisp encapsulation of, uh, of some powerful ideas to help you and your organizations work together, think together, and learn together. And there's other biomaterial in the handout. And with that, I don't take any more of Russ's time. Let me introduce Dr. Russell Akoff. After that introduction, I can hardly wait to hear what I have to say. <laughs> I feel a little like a pornographic movie that's just being shown to people who've engaged in sex. <laughs> Nevertheless, uh, I want to talk about a very fundamental change that's occurring, something that happens only uh, 400 years ago. We go through a profound cultural change that the historian calls a change of age or a new era. Now, let me see if I can get this working. OK. Uh, there is no agreement yet as to what we will call this transformation. It's interesting that the Renaissance was not named the 200 years after it was completed. People during the Renaissance weren't going around saying, hey, we live in the Renaissance. They weren't aware of it because the change occurs slowly. but fundamentally. And we're still in the early stages of a very fundamental transformation of our culture. And the principal change which is occurring and accounts for the change of age 
was captured in this wonderfully brief statement by Einstein. We can solve the problems created by our old way of thinking by using the same way of thinking. There's a very interesting thing about this quotation. I have literally shown this to thousands of executives. And I always ask them, I ask you, does anybody disagree with this? And nobody ever does. And then I ask them what it means and they have the foggiest idea. It's very easy to agree with something you don't understand. And yet, Understanding this statement, I'm going to argue, is the most important thing that a manager can understand. Because without it, they're going to be doomed to failure. It's amazing how little the typical manager in the United States knows about how inefficient we are. You know that it takes 23 new corporations in the United States every year to have one that will survive the first year. There are 22 failures for every success. The average life of an American corporation is only 11 and a half years. That's 50% of the American corporations on a Fortune 500 list 25 years ago no longer exist. That the Dow Index, which consists of the stock price of the so-called blue chips, has only one of its original corporations on that list, General Electric, all the others have disappeared. I had a professor that understood that. He once asked the class, what was the proof of the superiority of the American economy? And all us smart students, you know, we knew the answer, GNP per capita, consumption rate, standard of living, and so on. He kept saying, no, 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 no. And finally, we gave up and asked him, he said, there's no other economy in the world that could survive as much inefficiency as ours. And what a wonderful criterion it is. You know, it's a very optimistic one. Because if we can be the best with 22 failures for every success and an 11 and a half year average life of a corporation, think of what would happen if we reduce it to 15 failures for every success or increase the average life of a corporation by a couple of years. And we can, by changing our way of thinking and understanding why it is necessary. And that's what I hope to show you today. So until managers understand that statement and its implications, they will not be able to cope with the critical problems confronting them now. That's what I hope to show you this morning. You can get to the moon, but you can't work this thing. <laughs> Now, can I have the next one, please? These are just some quotations that show you what I've already said. I'd like to get further on. Next one. Ah, we finally got it. The old way of thinking talked about by Einstein is called analysis. Analysis is a way of thinking that was formalized during the Renaissance when science as we know it today began. It's the natural way of thinking. You can see it in any child. If you give a child a toy that they've never had before or in a clock or a radio, anything that they don't know about and let them alone with it and watch what they do in an effort to understand it, you'll observe they go through three steps. In the first step, they will take the thing or a thing that they want to understand apart. They reduce it down to its indivisible parts if they possibly can. That's what science does. Take any physical object and the physicist tries to reduce it to ultimately indivisible parts, the atom. Of course, it turned out later the atom was divisible and now we're down to partons and quarks but we still follow the belief that to understand anything, you've got to reduce it to its ultimate individual parts and how they behave. And that's the first step in analytical thinking. The child takes the toy apart. In the second step, they try to understand what each part does. And then they try to assemble the understanding of the parts into an understanding of the whole. Now, that way of thinking permeates our culture. If you go to a business school and want to understand business and management, 
Think of what you go through. You take business apart. You study production separately, marketing separately, finance, personnel, taxation, and so on. And then the expectation is, after you've been exposed and understand all the parts, you will be able to aggregate them and integrate them into an understanding of the whole. That was the hope of the scientific development that occurred out of the Renaissance, that through analysis, we'd be able to understand everything. Uh, that dream was exploded about 1954. A German biologist, let me see, I have to get to the third step. A German biologist by the name of von Berlanthi migrated to Canada because of Hitler. And he published some papers which had originally appeared in German and English into a book. And the book was not particularly important, significant, but the concept in which it focused was. That concept was the system. The book was called General Systems Theory. Now, the reason it was important was it made us aware of what analysis could not do. And that's what Einstein was talking about. Uh, let's take a few simple examples. The American automobile that was developed in mass production between the two world wars was a six-passenger car. Why was it six? Why not eight, nine, 15, three, one? Do you think that taking those cars apart and analyzing them will tell you why it was a six passenger car? Of course not. Why was the motor in the front? Will taking the car apart tell you why it was in the front? It doesn't have to be in the Volkswagen, it was in the back. Or a better one, how many of you have ever been to England? Oh, a number of you, good. You know they drive on the wrong side of the road. Why? Do you think you take, taking British cars apart, analyzing them, will explain why the British drive on the other side of the road? Of course not. What we began to understand is that there are a class of phenomena called systems which cannot be understood by taking them apart. And so we began to study systems and the implication of being a system. Well, let's take a look at what a system is. First, well, we're skipping one all the time. I'm sorry, I don't know why. Yeah, now the one after this. I give up. A system is a whole, which is defined by its function in a larger system of which it is a part. The system is a whole, that's spelled with a W, that is defined by its function in a larger system of which it is a part. So how do you define an automobile, for example? You define by what it does, not how it works. An automobile is an instrument for carrying people from one place to another under their control in privacy and on the land. So you describe its function. What's a computer? You describe what it does. It's a logical manipulator of symbols. Hey. What's a person? You define a person by what the meaning of life is, what they do, not how they work. How they work does not provide explanations. Explanations come from the answer to questions that begin with the word why. And what we came to understand is that you cannot understand the system by analyzing it. And the reasons are the properties which its parts must have. In order to perform its defining function, a system must have at least two essential parts. And the essential parts are the parts without which it can't perform its defining function. So a motor is essential for an automobile. Without a motor, it can't run. Fuel pump is essential. A battery is essential. The windshield wiper isn't. The cigarette tray isn't. The rug on the floor isn't. You have certain essential parts. Your heart, your lungs, your brain, you can't live without them. But you don't need your fingers. You don't need your arm. 
In fact, you can live without both arms and both legs. They're not necessary. But you can't live without a brain. The essential parts of a system then are the critical things to understand. Each essential part of a system can affect the behavior or the properties of the whole. It's clear in the automobile, the way an automobile works is affected by its motor, its fuel pump, and its battery. You are affected by the performance of your brain, your stomach, and your lungs, and so on. I mentioned this to a group of doctors a while back, and one of them immediately objected. He said there's one part of the human body that's not known to have any effect on it at all. Now, I've heard this hundreds of times, but I had to pretend this was the first time. I didn't want to offend him. So I said, there is? What is it? Now, what do you think he said? What's the part of the body that has no effect on it at all? Come on, you know it. The appendix, right? What does the word appendix mean? It means added on or attached to. It's not a part. You see, the interesting thing is, if they ever find a use for the appendix, they'll have to change its name. <laughs> the appendix of a report is not a part of the report. It's what you add on to justify the expense. <laughs> it is not a part. Every part of a system can affect its behavior or its properties. But the way it does it always depends on what at least one other part is doing. No essential part of a system has an independent effect on the whole. So the way the heart affects you depends on the lungs because the heart requires oxygen and the lungs provide the oxygen. If the lungs stop operating, the heart won't operate. But they both depend on the brain for signals but the brain requires oxygen also, so that the essential parts of a system form a connected set. The fuel pump of an automobile and the battery are connected, maybe not directly, but, but between any two essential parts of a system, there's always a path, because no essential part has an independent effect on the whole. And if we take the parts and group them together and form what are called subsystems, they have the same property. No subsystem, group of parts, has an independent effect on the whole. They always depend on some other subsystem. In the human body, you've got the metabolic subsystem, the nervous subsystem, the motor subsystem, and so on, and they all interact. In the automobile, you've got the drivetrain, the braking system, you've got the electrical system, and they all interact. And so therefore, the critical thing that happens is that we learn that a system is a whole which cannot be divided into independent parts. Now, why is that so damn important? It sounds almost kind of trivial, doesn't it? Until you begin to look at the implications of that simple statement. What it means is that if you take a system apart, it loses all of its essential properties. If I brought an automobile in this room, this is big enough to take one, and took it apart, but kept every part in this room, I don't have an automobile, I've got the parts of an automobile. Because the system is the product of the interactions of the parts and not the sum of the parts. And therefore, when you take a system apart, it loses all of its essential properties. And the critical point is, and so do its parts. You see, if I take a car apart, I've got the motor as a separate entity sitting here on the floor. The car can't move without the motor. The motor moves the automobile. But when I take it out of the automobile, it can't move a damn thing, not even itself. It just sits there. You can't think without a brain. But a surgeon removes the brain from your head and puts it on a table, it doesn't sit there and think. It doesn't do a damn thing. And so when a system is taken apart, it loses its essential properties, and so do the parts. And now you can see why a business school is a bunch of nonsense. Because look what it does. You go into a business school to study business, but what do you take courses in? The parts, production, marketing, finance, personnel, separately. 
each one considered independently of the others. The assumption is when you know each of those parts separately, you'll understand the whole and that's absolute nonsense. Because you never learn the essential properties of marketing, which how it interacts with production and finance and personnel. What's essential about the parts is how they interact. And that leads to an incredible principle, which is diametrically opposed to the current principle employed by almost all management in the Western world. The basic assumption of management is that when you improve the performance of the parts taken separately, you will improve the performance of the whole. And that's absolutely false. The way we manage, you take a corporation apart, create divisions or departments or subsidiaries, and then try to have each one run as well as possible. The assumption is when they each run as well as possible, the whole will be. And that is absolutely false. In fact, you can destroy a system by making its parts better. And you can improve a system by making its parts worse. And those are two things that management does not understand. And you'll be one of those corporations that don't survive in the long run until you understand them. Consider the following example so you can see that this principle holds. According to the ultimate source of all knowledge, the New York Times, there are 457 different automobiles in the United States. Suppose we bought one of each and brought them into a large garage, then hired a hundred of the best automotive engineers in the world, brought them into that garage and said, find out which car has the best motor. Well, let's assume they come out and tell you the Rolls Royce has the best motor. That's a pretty good guess. Okay, good. Let's try the transmission next. Well, the Mercedes has the best transmission. Let's try the fuel pump. Well, maybe the Lincoln has the best fuel pump. And one by one, you take every essential part of an automobile. They run tests on the 457 cars and tell you which one is the best. So now I have a list of all the essential parts of an automobile and which is the best one available. You got the picture? Now tell them to remove those parts from those cars and put them together into the best possible automobile. Because now, for the first time, we're going to have a car that consists only of the best available parts. Do we get the best automobile? Of course not. In fact, do you get an automobile? No. Why? Because the parts don't fit together. It's how they work together, how they interact, that determines the performance of a system, not how the parts act separately. Take the weakest car in the United States, which used to be the Hyundai. It's underpowered. Well, that's easy to fix. Why don't we take a Rolls-Royce motor and put it in a Hyundai? Will you get a better car? You get a better motor, but do you get a better car? Of course not. It won't work because the other parts are not designed to work with a Rolls-Royce motor. You see, there's only one profession that understands this characteristic of a system, how the parts interact, and that's architecture. And the reason they understand it is that they do it unconsciously. I used to be an architect. That's where I started until I was saved. And shortly after I graduated and started working in an architect's office, a lovely young family came in and told me that they had bought a lot out in the country, which I went out to see. It was a beautiful three-acre lot on the side of a hill, heavily wooded, with a ravine and a stream running through it. Boy, it was idyllic. They said, we want to build a house there that looks like it grew out of the ground. So we want it to be built of wood. On the upper floor, which we will enter from the higher part of the hill, we want a living room, dining room, and kitchen. as one large room with a big fireplace. Then we want three bedrooms, one for each of the three kids, with their own bath. We want a master bedroom with our bath and a utility room for the laundry. Down below on the lower level, which we can walk out of to the lower level of the hill, we want a large playroom or party room. 
A study for the master of the house that can double as a guest room with its own bath. A utility room for the furnace and air conditioning. A two-car garage with a do-it-yourself workshop at the back end. We want it to be contemporary architecture, and they told me how much they wanted to spend. After I had all this information, I told them to go away, come back in a week, and I'd have some, something to show them. Now, have you ever watched what an architect does? Because he does something incredible. He does not draw a picture of the rooms and say, how do I put them together into a house? The first thing he draws is the house without any parts. He gets a concept of the whole without parts. Then he puts the rooms into the house. So the rooms are designed to fit the whole. The whole is not a consequence of fitting the parts together. And that has certain consequences. When he's done doing that, he looks at the bedroom, he says, it's a lousy bedroom. It's too long and narrow, and it doesn't have cross ventilation, so I'm going to have to change that bedroom. And now he employs a system principle which a manager almost never uses. The criterion for changing the room is not how much better the room is, but how much better the house is. And he will even make a room worse to make the house better. When did you ever hear a manager tell a division manager, a subordinate, next year we don't want you to perform as well. It will help the corporation. You can hardly conceive of that. But it happens in architecture all the time. It happened in the first house I designed. When the design was completed, contracts were let, but construction had not begun. The housewife called me one day. She said, Russ, I can't wait till that house is built and we can move in. I love it. But there's one aspect of it that worries me. The party and playroom is on the lower level. The kitchen is up above. So when there's a party or the kids are playing, I'm going to be running up and down the stairs all the time. Can't we put a dumbwaiter in so I can pass food and drinks up and down without climbing the steps? Now, you all know what a dumbwaiter is. It's a little box. It's an elevator into which you can put stuff, and it'll go up and down between the two floors. I said, sure, we can put a, a dumbwaiter in. But in order to do it, I have to take counter space away from the kitchen. The kitchen will be harder to work in with less space. She said, I don't care. I want a dumbwaiter. And she got it. Look what she did. She made the house better, but the kitchen worse. Now, I only know of one place that I've ever experienced in over 400 corporations where a manager will deliberately make something worse in order to make the whole better. It's in supermarkets. Research was done in supermarkets a number of years ago, which came up with a surprising result. The average woman knows the price of only six different products. She thinks she knows the price of everything. But it turns out only about six, and you can guess what they are. They're milk, bread, the staples. Supermarkets learn this, and so now they will offer bread, which they pay 75 cents a loaf for, on sale for 50 cents. They will lose money on every loaf of bread they sell. It's called a loss leader. Why do they offer bread at a loss? Hmm? To bring the housewife in to buy the profitable products. By offering one product at a loss, they hope to maximize the total sale. It's a case of sacrificing the part to improve the whole. That's the only place I've ever seen where management deliberately does it. It requires a very different way of managerial thinking to put the focus on a performance of the whole and to evaluate the parts, not by how well they perform, but by how well they contribute to the performance of the whole. It will require, as you'll see, a different kind of organization and different measures of performance. Therefore, we need a different way of thinking about systems, not analysis. Let's take uh, the British driving on the left instead of the right side of the road. You know why they do that? It's a fascinating story. 
You see, during the medieval period, when the United States didn't exist, as we know it today, except for Indian, the principal form of transportation was a horse. How many of you have ever ridden a horse? Good. What side do you mount a horse from? Left. You always mount a horse from the left. So now imagine a road, and you're leading a horse that you want to get on. But you want to stand on the road where you are away from the traffic. Which side of the road will you hold the horse to mount on? You want the horse to be between you and the traffic, right? And if you're mounting from the left, you will stand on the left side of the road. When you mount the horse, you then travel on the left of the road. So the British wound up driving on the left because they used horses. The carts followed the horses. Now the interesting thing is that when the British came over to this country, the pilgrims, they rode on the left in carts because that's what they had done in Britain. The brake of the cart was outside on the right-hand side, and you pulled it back and put a shoe against the wheel so the cart wouldn't move when you stopped. It was on the right because right hands were developed, but not left hands. You may be aware that during the medieval period into the modern period, left-handedness left -handedness was considered to be possession by the devil. When I was in school, in primary school, you were not allowed to write with your left hand. You had to learn how to write with your right, because this was a bad thing. Left arms were underdeveloped, so the brake was on the right, so that your strong arm could pull it on. Now they came over to the States, and the young man is riding in a cart one day, and it's pouring rain. He wants to stop, he's got to put his arm outside to pull the brake on, it gets all wet. He said, hey, this is stupid. I'm going to move the brake into the cart so I can keep my arm dry when I put it on. But now he had to put the brake on with his left arm, which was not strong enough for a hard brake. He said, I'll take care of that by moving the driver to the other side of the cart so now he can use his right arm to put the brake on, which is in the middle of the cart. But now he had a new problem. He couldn't see around the cart in front of him. If you ever drove an American car in England, you know the problem. You can't pass because you can't see what's up ahead. So how did he solve that problem? Move the carts to the other side of the road. So you see, it was all because of the difference between the left and the right arm that we ultimately wound up riding on the right in order to keep our arms dry and seeing around the carts in front that we're different from the English. The explanations always lie outside the system, never inside. Why does an automobile, as it was originally developed, a six-passenger car? It was designed for the average American family, which was 5.6. Why is it getting smaller? The average American family is only 3.2. You don't need a six-passenger car anymore. Why is the motor up front? That's an easy one. Why was it up front? Because that's where the horse was. The original automobile was called what? A horseless carriage, exactly. How do you measure the power of the motor, which replaces the horse? Horsepower. You see, understanding always lies in the relationship of a system to its environment. What it comes from, outside, in, not inside, out. When you analyze a system, take it apart, know how the parts work, that provides knowledge, know-how. If the car stops on you, you want to find out which part broke down and replace it. That's knowledge. If you want to understand the car, no amount of analysis will give it to you. You need a different way of thinking, which takes you outside the system, and that's called synthesis. Now, synthesis, like analysis, is a three-step process, but it's exactly the opposite of analysis. Well, let's see, synthetic thinking. In the first step of analysis, you take the thing which you want to understand, the part. But in the first step of synthesis, you take the thing that you want to understand as a part of a larger whole. You don't take it apart. You see it as a part of a larger whole. 
So if I want to understand an automobile, first question is what's an automobile a part of? Transportation system. What's a corporation a part of? The economy. What's a university a part of? The educational system. Exactly the opposite of analysis. In the second step of analysis, you try to understand what the parts do taken separately. But in the second step of synthesis, you try to understand what the containing system does. What's the transportation system? What's the economy? What's the educational system? And then, instead of aggregating the parts and trying to explain subsystems, you try to explain the system you're worried about by identifying its role or function in the larger system of which it is a part. It's exactly the opposite of analysis. So you disaggregate the containing system so as to identify the role or function of the whole, uh, which is the system that you're trying to understand. Three steps, but exactly the opposite. It requires an entirely different way of thinking with incredibly important implications to management. And that's what we really want to look at. What does all this academic discussion have to do with management? And that's what I want to show you, because it has the most profound effects on management that you can imagine. To the extent that we can be relatively sure that organizations which do not understand this distinction between analysis and synthesis, and which do not use both, are in for serious trouble. Analysis will yield knowledge, know-how, but never understanding. Synthesis yields understanding, but not knowledge. That distinction was not made until the 1950s, believe it or not. And the big surprise is science doesn't explain anything. It provides know-how, how it works. The law of gravity tells you how things fall. It doesn't tell you why they fall. Not at all. Science provides no explanation. And so a whole new domain of knowledge is called for, the nature of which we'll see in a moment. So the essential characteristic of a system depend on how its parts interact, not on how they act taken separately, and therefore the performance of a system is not necessarily improved when the performance of each part is taken separately. In fact, performance may be reduced by making the parts of the system perform better. The performance of the system is not the sum of its parts, but the product of their interactions. The prevailing way of managing is divide and conquer. It's the way all business schools are constructed. I retired from Wharton in 1986. And when I did, the Wharton Journal, which is the principal publication of the business school, asked me to write an article reflecting on the value of a business school education. Boy, what a mistake that was. They've regretted it ever since. I wrote this article in which I said there are three outcomes of a business education. The first is every student is provided with a vocabulary that allows them to talk with authority about subjects that they do not understand. The second thing it does is give them a set of management principles which have demonstrated their ability to withstand any amount of disconfirming evidence. And the third thing it does is give them a ticket to a job where they can learn something about management. And that's the only thing that makes it worthwhile. But you can have a good time for a couple years, and I guess that's justified. But sure as hell don't learn how to manage, and every corporation knows that. You ever see a corporation hire an MBA and put them right to work as a manager? They know they're going to have to give him a couple years so he can learn what he was supposed to learn in school, but didn't. I spent five years studying ar architecture. That's how long it took. And I got a job in the architect's office. The first job they gave me was to put a new face on the theater out in the neighborhood. I didn't know how to do it. I had never had to design something that had to be built. I was taught architecture by drawing pictures. I designed a new UN headquarters, new ports, new uh, crematoriums, all kinds of stuff. I never built anything. 
They never occurred to them that that's what architects ultimately did, was design things that could be built. The school was absolutely useless. So we're beginning to learn something about education of management as well. So it follows that the most important thing that management needs to know is how its parts interact and how these interactions affect the performance of the whole. Current structure of corporations into vertical silos prevents the development of this kind of knowledge. And that's why we have 22 failures for every success. Now, what I want to do is leave that generalized thinking and look specifically at management, how systems thinking affects management itself. First, let me see, with your help, if you have any questions about what I've said up to this point, or argument, I dare you. <laughs> OK, we'll go a little further. I'm going to give you plenty of time to raise hell. The first important implication was the discovery that nature and organizations are not divided into disciplines the way a university is. You see, we come out of the university with an incredibly incorrect notion that there are physical problems, chemical problems, biological problems, psychological problems, social problems, production problems, marketing problems, financial problems, personal, and so on. Because that's the way a university is organized, right? Into disciplines. There's something like 147 disciplines today. And the university reflects most of them. But there is no such thing as a management problem. There is no such thing as a production problem, a marketing problem, a personnel problem, a social problem, a health problem. There are absolutely no such thing. The adjective in front of the word problem tells you something, but it doesn't tell you one damn thing about the problem. And that was an incredible discovery. Let me give you an example that will show you that this is true, and then we can discuss it more abstractly. Just north of the University of Pennsylvania, where I spent 25 years, there's a so-called urban black ghetto, which in 1967 consisted of 80 city blocks of 22,000 people, 100% black. It had the highest crime rate in the city, the highest rate of skipping school in the city dropouts, the highest rate of births outside of wedlock, the highest rate of drug addiction, you name it. And so in the press of Philadelphia, this area, which was technically called Mantua, was referred to as the bottom. Now in 67, a young man who had been a gang leader, Herman Rice, had recently married and his wife almost got killed in a crossfire of a gang war. He said something's got to be done. So he organized a small group of ex-gang leaders. These are people in their early 20s. And he called it the Young Great Society. And they undertook a self-development program for their neighborhood. What happened after 67 is a long story and an incredible one. I don't have time to go into it. I can tell you this much, that there are 62 cities in the United States which currently use the process which Herman Rice developed in Mantua. He received the highest civilian award provided in the United States, given by the president to him for the work he did. Fortunately, at the very beginning of his effort, he ran into a problem he couldn't handle, and he came to the university for help, and he happened to come to me. He wanted some drawings to go along with the proposal he was making to the city planning department. He came to me because I held a joint appointment between the Wharton School and the School of Architecture, having once been part of that profession. And he asked if I could help him get these drawings made. I organized a group of faculty to meet with him and talk with him about the problem, six faculty members. We provided him with the drawings and he got the money. He thought this was pretty good. So he asked whether he could ask us for help as he needed along the way. 
In a very short time, we began to meet regularly. We had two people from the university regularly assigned full-time to work with him. And we developed a very intimate relationship, working and helping him do the things he wanted to do. Every Monday morning, about six of the leaders from the community and a small group of faculty met in my office to discuss the problems for the coming week. It was during one of these meetings that somebody came in with a piece of news that stopped the meeting dead. There was an 83-year-old woman in the neighborhood who had organized what's called the geriatric set. It was an incredible group of older people. They had built and operated three infant care centers. These are not daycare centers, infant care centers. They took babies three months old until they were three years old when they could go to a daycare center so that mama could go back to work or go back to school. The amazing thing was about half of those kids were at least literate at three years old. These people planted trees throughout the neighborhood. They cleared vacant lots. They removed graffiti. They did all kinds of constructive things. Unfortunately, she had a rheumatic heart but there were no medical facilities in Mantua. The closest medical facility, if you know Philadelphia, is a Presbyterian hospital at 38th and Market Street. That's two miles from where she lived. She couldn't walk that distance. There was no public transportation in Mantua. It was too dangerous. She couldn't call a cab because she couldn't afford one if she could find one, and that was very difficult to do in Mantua. So she did without help. Until... We took an old house that had been condemned, remodeled it, and the Hospital University of Pennsylvania, which is the largest university-based hospital in the country, put a free clinic in that house that operated three days a week. And for the first time in her life, she was able to get medical attention. Each month, she went to that clinic for a checkup. She had gone that morning. They gave her an EKG, which is the usual thing, a mild stress test, the usual things you do to a person with a heart problem. She passed all the tests, so they dismissed her and told her she could go home. Home consisted of two rooms on the fourth floor of a big old converted house. On the third flight of stairs, returning to her home, she had a heart attack and died. That was the news that was brought to us. The room went silent. We all knew that woman well. The first one to speak was Sam Martin, a professor of community medicine. He said, damn it, I've been telling you we need more doctors in the clinic. If we had more doctors, we'd be able to make house calls, which we can't do now. And if we were able to make house calls, this never would have happened. She had no right to be going up and down four flights of stairs. It was obvious, so nobody had any comments. The silence until Frank Adams, the professor of economics, spoke up. He turned to the professor of community medicine and said, Hey, Sam, there's no shortage of doctors. They're not in your clinic, but they're all over the city. But she couldn't call one because her welfare payments weren't large enough, and there's no national health care plan. If we had a national health care plan, she'd be entitled to a doctor, private practitioner or not. And that was equally obvious. Silence again. Then Larry Goldfarb, a professor of architecture, said, why don't we make them put elevators in any building that's a multiple dwelling unit with three or more floors? That would obviously have prevented the problem. And finally, the only woman present, a professor of social work, shook her head. He said, my God, none of you know a damn thing about that woman, do you? You don't know that she was married when she was still a teenager and shortly thereafter gave birth to a son. At the birth of her son, she was deserted by her husband and never saw him again. She raised her son as a single parent with loving care and he was brilliant. He went through public school in Mantua, competed for the mayor's scholarship and won it and got a fully paid scholarship at the University of Pennsylvania along with a stipend which supported him. 
He graduated at the top of his class and got a scholarship to the law school. He graduated number one from the law school and was hired by the largest law firm in Philadelphia. He is now a senior partner in that law firm. He's married and has two children and lives in a beautiful house out in the suburb, which happens to be all on one floor. If she weren't alienated from her son, she'd be living with him, where she'd have all the money she needs and no steps to climb. Now here's your midterm examination question. Is that a medical problem, an economic problem, an architectural problem, or a social work problem? Yeah. Which one? Of course, the ones who are smart will tell you right away, it's none of them. It's a problem. What are the adjectives, the disciplinary adjectives in front telling you? They tell you the point of view of the person looking at the problem. Not anything about the problem. Now, what's the significance of that? The efficiency of looking at a problem in different ways is not equal. The trick is to find a way of looking at it which gives you the biggest bang for the buck. And I can tell you from experience, because I've worked in more than 400 corporations in 17 countries, that 90% of the problems that arise in a corporation are best solved somewhere other than where they are recognized. But 90% of them are solved where they're recognized. So if a marketing manager comes in in the morning and finds the sales went to hell in New England, he says, uh-oh, I got a marketing problem. And he tries to solve it by manipulating the variables under his control. It's a discipline. And he's almost always wrong. And you want to see a simple example? Is there anybody in this room who never had a headache? Good. When you get a headache, what do you do? Brain surgery? Well, that's where the headache is. Why the hell do you take a pill? Because the pill contains a chemical. And you swallow it, it goes into the stomach where it dissolves. The chemical is absorbed by the bloodstream, which then carries it and deposits it on the brain. And that's a whole lot better way to take care of a headache than brain surgery. Because somebody understands the way a system works. You treat a headache by taking a pill instead of doing brain surgery. But not if you're a manager. If you're a manager, you do brain surgery. Well, let me give you an example from industry so you don't think this is an abstraction. The Champion Paper and Fiber Company, which is now a part of international paper, is the largest producer of coated papers in the United States. Now, coated papers are a very high quality of paper which have a transparent coating of clay on them. They are produced in order to receive color photography. So all the art magazines, all the art books, the expensive magazines like Time, Life, and so on, are printed on colored, on coated paper. Champion was the largest producer of that kind of paper in the United States. It produced it in a mill in Hamilton, Ohio, which had eight continuous production lines, starting at one end with wood pulp and clay, and coming out at the other end with big cylinders of this paper wrapped in rolls four feet high that were shipped off to printers. The company was one of the oldest companies in the United States. I happen to remember the year it was organized because it's historically important. It was organized in 1812 by a Quaker family that had the most unusual slogan of any company I've ever heard of. They would never discontinue a product so that all of their customers were guaranteed continuity of product into eternity. As a result, by the time of this event that I'm describing in the 60s, they had 2,700 different products on their list. The vice president of production called me one day because I had done some work with the company and asked me to meet him in Hamilton, Ohio at this plant, which I did. He told me that in the last five years, productivity had gone down by 20% and the plant was no longer profitable. 
He said this was a serious problem because it was one of the principal sources of profit to the company. He said, I had to find the reason. He said, well, since it's an old plant, the first thing that occurred to me, the equipment is old, so it's not operating as well as it used to operate. He said, I had a series of time studies done on each production line and the parts of it, and there was absolutely no difference over a five-year period. It is not the equipment that's responsible. Well, he said, the only other explanation that occurred to me was it's down more for maintenance and repair because it's older. So he collected all the maintenance and repair parts, assembled them and analyzed them, and there was no difference over five years. But he still had a 20% reduction in tonnage of paper produced per day. He said, it's finally occurred to me what had happened. He says, five years ago, we dominated the market. Our competition tried everything, but they didn't succeed in taking it away from us. Until they came out with some new papers at reduced cost, and they began to eat into our market share. We responded by producing new papers to match theirs. In the last five years, we have introduced approximately 500 new papers. So that today, he said, we have 3,200 papers in our catalog. Now, he said, what happens when you increase the number of products to be produced over a fixed production facility? Well, most of you know that, don't you? What will happen? If we have the same plant, but we're not going to produce 3,200 rather than 2,700 papers. The production runs become smaller, right? More frequent. But between production runs, you have to adjust the equipment. What do you call the period between production runs where you change the setting on equipment? Setup cost. He now made a plot of setup costs. And setup costs were going up exactly the mirror image in which productivity was going down. He now had his headache. Increased setup created by the addition of products to the product line. Then he turned to us and said, can you schedule production so as to minimize setup costs? And we said, as a matter of fact, we can, for a very interesting reason. That's a classical problem in network theory, which had not been solved until about a month earlier. The Red Corporation offered a $10,000 prize for the first solution to that problem, and it appeared just about a month earlier by a professor at MIT. So here was a chance to use it. We explained all that to him. We said, however, we can't guarantee you a big saving. He said, why not? We said, because it depends also on your forecast. You see, if we produce very efficiently for a bad forecast, you're not going to save money. But if you have a good forecast and produce efficiently, you can save a lot of money. He said, well, how can I find out? We said, well, what we ought to do is run a simulation of the plan on a computer for the last five years, we know exactly what you sold. We'll assume a perfect forecast. We'll use the new scheduling method, and we can estimate how much you would have saved over five years if you had a perfect schedule and the new scheduling method. If it's big, then it's worth going after. If the difference is small, then forget about it. He said, that's a good idea. Go ahead and do it. So we did. It took a little less than a month to do the thing. And we found out the difference was large enough to go after. But we also made an incredible discovery to us, but he knew this. 8% of the products accounted for 100% of the profits of the corporation because of the old age products. Those 8% that accounted for 100% of the profit accounted for 90% of the production. So we came back to the manager and said, look, we know you told us to look at the scheduling problem, but do you realize the problem exists because you added products to the product line? Most of them are unprofitable. Why don't you just reduce the product line? You can get a bigger saving than you can by changing scheduling. He blew his top. Damn it, he said, I knew you were going to come out with something stupid like that. He said, why is it stupid? He said, that's marketing's responsibility. That's not mine. We said, that's fine. We work with marketing. We'll go talk to them. No, you won't, he said. Well, we don't understand. Why won't you let us talk to marketing? He said, if you go talk to those bastards, 
and they think that they have now solved the marketing problem, they'll think that this gives them a right to come in here and tell me how to run these plants, and I don't want them around here. You keep away from them, he said. Now, I'm sure you recognize this kind of thing. We argued, but it didn't do any good. So we went back to schedule. We cheated. We got the computing department of the company to run off a list of 3,200 products from the most profitable to the least, for each one, how much was made each year, how much was sold, to whom, and what quantity. This was an old IBM 700 series computer, so we got, you remember those big accordions? That's what we got, one of these accordion sheaths of paper. Then we started at the bottom of the list with the least profitable product and worked our way up and asked the following question. How many products will we have to drop from the product line to get the same saving we would get with perfect scheduling and a perfect forecast, which we'll never get? And the answer amazed us. It was 4% of the product line. That's less than the number of products that were added in the last five years. So we went back to the production manager and said, look, we know you told us not to do this, but are you aware of the fact that you only have to drop 4% of the products to get a bigger saving than you can possibly get by scheduling? He blew his stop again. We argued with him. And finally, we made a proposition to him. He said, look, if you let us go talk to market, we will explain that we're there against your will and why. And if, despite that, they come in and try to tell you how to run production, we will complete the study at no cost to you. He stopped. He said, put that on paper. <laughs> we wrote the most peculiar letter of agreement you've ever seen. But he let us go to see marketing. So I met with the vice president of marketing in New York at their headquarters, went through this explanation I've just given you. And he sat there going like this until I got to the end. I said, now what we'd like to do is drop at least the bottom 4% of the product line. He said, you can't do it. He said, why not? You've agreed with everything we said. And he went like this. He said, Russ, I'm going to teach you a lesson. And boy, he did. I learned more about marketing in the next five minutes than you can in any course in any business school. He said, what product is at the bottom of your list? I opened up my file. I said, product 891J64. No, no, no. He said, I don't want to know the number. What kind of product is it? He said, I don't know. What difference does it make? Oh, boy. He said, you're going to be hard to educate. Let me start over. Who bought that product? I checked my thing. I said, last year you made one sale to one customer, 94 K-53. No, 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 he said, I didn't ask you the number. Who bought the product? I said, look, I don't know, and I don't have to be a genius to know it doesn't matter. Because this is what I know. You sold two pounds of that paper last year to somebody. The smallest quantity you can produce is 2,000 pounds. Do you know how many years of inventory that is? I say, you're not going to live to see the end of that roll. I don't have to be a genius to know that's stupid. He said, yes, you do. And he looked at me. He said, do you know who Clara Booth Luce is? I didn't know why he asked the question, but I said, yes, I know who Clara Booth Luce is. Who? He said, well, she's primarily a playwright. She's written a very successful play, which is on Broadway right now. But she's also active politically and working in the formation of a women's movement. She was one of the originators of the women's movement. He said, good. He said, you have to know whether she's married or not. He said, yeah, she's married. That's what the Luce is on her name. Her name was Claire Booth until she married Mr. Luce. He said, good. Do you know Mr. Luce? Who is he? I said, he's chairman of Time, Life, and Force. And he said, great. He said, do you also know he's our largest customer? And he bought $44 million worth of paper from us last year. And you think I'm going to deny his wife two lousy pounds of letter paper and run the risk of losing his business? He said, don't be stupid. That's not the lesson. I'm used to that kind of stuff because I'm an academic.
So I asked him the question, how the devil do you know you're going to lose $44 million worth of business over a lousy two pounds of letter paper? And then I learned the lesson. He said, I don't know. And you can be damn sure I'm not going to try to find out. <laughs> See, he was a great marketing man. He knew it wasn't worth the risk, however small it was. So we left, we were like a whip dog with our tail between our legs. We got back and God, we were frustrated because scheduling was not the way to deal with that problem. So in our frustration, we recalled a principle in science that's frequently overlooked. It's a marvelous principle called Hitch's Principle. Charles Hitch was a member of the Rand Corporation who moved up to become president of the University of California, one of your neighbors. And in a rare moment of clarity, he made the following statement. If you can't solve the problem you're facing, you must be facing the wrong problem. Now we're going to take a break. When we come back, I'm going to tell you how we rethought the nature of the problem and indicated a completely different way of approaching the problem.